Hello, Hello. Welcome, welcome to King's, King's Church. Church. We're so glad you're here. Welcome, welcome to King's Church. Church. We're, We're so, so glad you could join us. Hello, welcome to King's Church. We're, We're so, so glad you're here. Good morning, my name is Steve and I lead the team here at King's Church and it is so good to have you with us this morning. We are really glad that you're here. As you'd have seen from our countdown, we have only one more Sunday to go. This is our final Kings at Home Sunday. And uh, from next week on the 27th, we're gonna to be together again, meeting at the Edgerston Park Hotel. I'm gonna share some more details later in the video about that, how you can book in and uh, come to worship, to hear from God's word, to be together. There is gonna be an online element. I'll share a little bit about that too. Um, so that's to come later. Right now, as I said, it's so good to have you. I want to wish you a happy Father's Day, especially any fathers out there. Uh, may God bless you. He is our Father in heaven. May, he, may you know him uh, on this day as you celebrate. But right now, we're going to have a time of worship. We're going to come and focus on God. We're going to bring ourselves before him. And, uh, and then we're going to have a message from Tim Suffield in our One John series. So lots to look forward to. But right now, let's ready our hearts for worship. And let's worship God together.
62 says, Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honour depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to Him, for God is our refuge. There's an invitation for us today to come and find shelter with Jesus, to come and rest on his goodness, to come and declare that he's the rock that we stand on, that he is solid ground, that everything else around us might shake, but Jesus is solid ground. We've been planted on solid ground. So why don't you just bring your heart to him today, pour out your heart, pour out what's in there, pour out your feelings, pour out your thoughts and pour out your praise as we come to God. We're going to sing about him, we're going to declare his goodness, we're going to enjoy him together this morning. Thank you God. Thank you God. Thank you Jesus.
you to come and do what that song says, to come and pour out your heart to God, to come and rest your heart on his truth, on his kindness, on his grace. So why don't you do that this morning? Why don't you pour out your heart to God and as you do, allow praise to rise, allow worship to rise. Speak out the truth of who God is, of his promises, of his goodness. We'll, um, we'll sing together. Let's all, let's raise our voices and just declare the goodness of God. Pour out your hearts to Him. Say 
Jesus, we exalt you. We lift you high. Thank you that you are our rock. Thank you that you're our fortress. Thank you that you're our strong tower. God, thank you that you are the place that we run to over and over again and find your kindness, your love, your compassion, your mercy. God, we love being your children. We honour you today. Amen. Amen. It's good to worship God together. On next Sunday, 27th of June, we're going to be together again at the Ed Breston Park Hotel and we have a short promotional video just to give you a little bit of a flavour for what it's going to be like so you can imagine being there. So watch this and then I'll share a little bit more. We're really looking forward to being together again on Sunday the 27th of June. I am here at the Edgerston Park Hotel, our new venue. It's really convenient right near to Harborn Academy. There's loads of parking. We're going to go and show you around. The welcome team will be here ready to greet you at 10.30. We can answer any questions that you have and help you feel at ease. This is our main room and as you can see we have got a lot of space. We're going to be spending just over an hour in here together worshipping God and hearing a message from the Bible. We can't wait to be together. We are super excited to welcome back our children to King's Church. Uh, we are having lots of different activities for different, uh, different ages. So for our, our over fives, we'll be having you in the service the whole time. And we've got lots of activity packs to keep you busy with hopefully some prizes. For our under fours, we're going to be running a special kids group for the summer. Parents can drop off their children here at 11 o'clock for games, snacks and story time. We know you want to catch up with friends and welcome everyone that's new to King's Church. So why not bring along a drink and after the meeting, we'll all come outside and gather and catch up together. There's also plenty of space out here um, to have some picnic lunches as a church family. Um, we're hoping to play some football and some rounders and lots of different activities. So we're looking forward to seeing you out here on the field. So there you have it. Hopefully that gives you a little flavour of what to expect. We're really looking forward to seeing you on the 27th of June. Do be praying that we can get in with no restrictions. Uh, we will explain more nearer the time. We'll give you all the details that you need. But we're so looking forward to being together again. See you on the 27th. Hopefully that whets your appetite a little bit. I can't wait to be together on the 27th. Obviously there are some restrictions still in place if you've been following the news, seeing the government guidance. Um, so you will need to book in if you'd like to come. We're going to send an email to the whole church on Monday the 21st of June. Also you can book in through our website, on our social media channels. Um, we would love to see you there but you will need to book in, book your place. We can't wait to see you. For those of you that aren't able to make it, um, we're going to be live streaming our Sunday service. You'll be able to check that out from wherever you are. But I do want to encourage you, if you are able to be there in person, it would be really good to be together, to worship, to hear from God's word. I want to encourage you, if there's a way for you to be there, then do, do book your place. If you're worried about uh, COVID and uh, all the measures that we're taking, just want to let you know we are working really hard to make sure everything is safe. Um, when you sign up, all this kind of FAQ section will make sure all the guidance uh, that we're following is made available to you. And if you have any questions, then do head to our website. There's a little uh, button in the bottom corner called Connect. If you click on that, it means you can get in touch, you can ask a question, um, anything we can do to help you to feel safe, to feel secure, that when we come to together and uh, we are able to focus on what's most important which is worshipping God and being God's people together we want to do all that we can so uh, do let us know if that'd be helpful but for everyone else 27th of June we're going to be at the Edgerston Park Hotel 
As we come to meet together again, we know the importance of covering all that we do in prayer, that we trust our future uh, to a God who is known, who is seated on his throne, that he is the king. Um, that's why we're called King's Church. That is his church. He's leading us forward. And we don't want to make this big step without praying and um, bringing all that we're doing before him and saying, God, come and help us and bless us. It's not just our good ideas, but we're following you. So I'd love to invite you on Wednesday night to come to our prayer meeting on Zoom. I know that for many of us, we're getting a little bit of Zoom fatigue that now the allure of being back in person and meeting together is so real and tangible. But let me encourage you, let's prioritize prayer together. Let's be uh, on that Zoom call, eight o'clock, 45 minutes, an hour, it's not very long, but just to come and say, God, we want to trust you that, yeah, it's, you know, it's hard to give up an evening when we could be outside to come and pray, but God, we need you. Um, to help you enjoy it and to make it more engaging, why don't you invite someone around beforehand? Invite them around for dinner, come and join the prayer meeting together on Zoom. We're able to do that now in groups of six or two households. We would love to see you there. It's a great delight that we've got Duncan and Hannah Bell um, from uh, Revelation Church Manchester. They're going to be joining us at a prayer meeting. They've been meeting in person for the last couple of months and uh, I've invited them just to share a few of their stories and also to pray for us. I thought it'd be great to have them uh, yeah, share but also bless us pray. Um, so they're going to be there. One not to be missed. Do join us on Wednesday. If you'd like any more information about anything going on in the life of the church, then do head to our website, kingchurchbirmingham.org. All of the information you need should be there. Right now we're going to have a reading and then Tim is going to be preaching to us in our 1 John series. 1 John, love and light in a world of darkness. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Good morning, friends, and welcome to the last time that we are preaching on video. You've already been told many times, I'm sure, by this point in the video, that next week we're going to be in person in the hotel, uh, perhaps under some restrictions, but nonetheless able to be the gathered church, able to be together and worship together. It's such a joy. So the last time that we connect like this, next time I'm preaching, I'll be to see you in the face, which will be a wonder, um, I'm sure. But we are, so we're still in our series in 1 John, we've got to chapter 4, we're kind of heading towards the end of the letter, and we've reached this justly famous, beautiful passage that you've just had read to you, where we're told that God is love, and commanded to love one another, and told that because God is love, we should love each other. The beautiful passage that seems to perhaps you hear it to repeat itself quite often. There's we won't really have a chance to get into it today, but there's a very complicated structure in the Greek that there's a sort of poetic edge to what John is doing. He's deliberately layering up repetition to make some of his points. He uses in this section we've just had read, kind of natural section of the letter, he uses the word love 27 times, which you might think nothing of. That's three times three times three. Three cubed, which in, in, in the Bible, three obviously being the number of both of God and of perfection, is deliberate. That we have something going on here where John is carefully trying to make a simple but also 
quite complex, quite profound point about love and how we should love and that God is love, but do so in a beautiful, elevated way. Just sit with your Bible open while I'm preaching and do look over these words. They will speak to you and God will change you through them because this is the very word of God. So, We heard last time Derek was carefully taking us through that we should be testing the spirits. That is important to know truth from error. And then John immediately goes to say, well, but beloved, love, love one another. And so partly I'm sure in his mind is he's thinking about how we then communicate in truth and error. But it's bigger than that. He is commanding us to love one another. And that's the primary application that we're going to get to today is what he says at the start of verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. But, but to be clear, that's the sort of thing, I suppose, that we might think Christians say. That's the sort of churchy talk in some ways. We should notice that he's not being generic. He's being quite specific. He's not sort of saying, you must love everyone. Though there's nothing wrong with that and I actually think the way of Jesus would lead us towards that he's telling us specifically to love our brothers and sisters because it's love one another he's telling us to love others within the church so in the sense of the worldwide church all the followers and family of God all around the world but also specifically because this is written to um, seven specific local churches in what is now Turkey to love one another in our local church So as we read this King's Church and hear love one another and sort of nod along sagely because that's what you do when you hear this kind of thing, we should be thinking not, oh yes, I should love other people, but I need, as a direct command from the mouth of God, to love other people in King's Church Birmingham. I need to love, excuse me, specific different people within King's Church Birmingham. We, we have a tendency, I think I do as well, to, to lift commands like this and to go, I must love everyone, to talk into the church. And so we should start there. You've got to love specific other people in King's Church Birmingham. And why is that important? Because loving other people in a generic sense is easy. To love generic people is easy because they're not real. They don't have faces. It's easy for me to say, yeah, yeah, I I, I love others and sort of try and cultivate a warm regard towards the human race. That's not a hard thing and it's not helpful. and It doesn't get anyone anywhere. The difficult thing is to love particular specific people because generic people are lovely. Specific particular people like me have foibles and things that annoy you about them. And they hurt you and you offend them and they see you at your worst. They're the people that you've got to love. And again, you, you might start to think, well, that's, that's easy, isn't it? Because, you know, it's full of, King Church is full of lovely people. It's like, well, you maybe don't know us that well yet. But yes, people who are being perfected slowly by the love of Jesus and so are at least better than they were. So it's not hard then. Well... What we're going to do today, or try to do, is at least scratch the surface of what love is, and perhaps what it isn't. Because it's not just doing nice things for each other, though that is not a bad start. It's nice to do nice things. Please feel very free. But I don't think we all know what love is. Or at least we live uh, in a culture that has ways of speaking about love that are quite different from the way that the Bible does. And so we need to start off by saying, well, what is love? Our command is to love one another. We've got to love one another. What does that mean and how would we begin? We kind of think we know. And yet the word word love in English is quite broad. It captures all sorts of different things. In Greek, you might have heard this before, but multiple different words for love we use in the language. Three used commonly. And John and the other writers of the New Testament picked a fourth word that was quite obscure, not used in general daily speech, to be the word that's translated here as love. 
which on the face of it doesn't tell us very much. John goes on actually in the passage you've heard read to you to define exactly what love is. But it means we know what it's not because it's not any of the other three words that he didn't pick. So it's not the same thing as romantic or erotic love between a husband and a wife. It's not the same thing as love between a parent and a child. And it's not the same thing as kind of the love of good friends or siblings. So particularly that kind of friendship bond that's even closer than your, your brothers and sisters, your blood relations. It's not that love either. Those are all good. They are all to be commended. They all, to some extent, echo God's love. And yet, when we read love here, we should not go to any of them as models. Because none of that, and we tend to, we think love, we probably most of us jump to romantic love and sort of think, sure, husbands and wives. Or we might jump to parent and child. Like, well, God's our father, isn't he? Loves us like a, like a father loves their children. Well, that, that's definitely an analogy the New Testament uses, so it's not wrong. Or we might think of the love of friends. Well, Jesus calls himself our friend. In fact, also calls himself our husband. So all of these things might be in view, and they are, but yet, deliberately, in the original language, John and most of the other writers of the New Testament trying to do something a little bit differently. But he tells us exactly what he's doing. So let's look at the text together. So he says, Beloved, you must love one another because, verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God. Oh, that's terrifying. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Because God is love. Okay. So our definition for love starts in God. We'll pause there a second. He then moves on to, to greater clarity. But our definition for love starts in God. God is love's origin. God is love. Which some of the commentators would say is the most quoted and least understood sentence in the whole Bible and has been in history used to defend just about anything you can imagine, including things the Bible says are sin and against the way of Jesus. God is love. And yet so easily all of us misunderstand that and drift into thinking it means basically whatever we like. It means, firstly, that love comes from God, that he is the source of love, that all other love, to some extent, finds its origin in him, at least when it is properly ordered. But it is not the same thing as saying that love is God. So that love is not God. God does not, whatever we think is loving, is not who God is. And it's not the same thing as saying God is loving. So God is not simply loving. Don't miss him here. But God is not simply loving as though love existed outside of God and he acted like it. Instead, God is love. God is not, to put that differently, God is not what we think love is, nor is love what God says it is, as though it were arbitrary. But instead, love is who God is. Love is who God is. So to find out what love is, we look at what God does. We look at who he is, which is exactly what John does next. Verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among you, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. What does it mean to say that God is love? John says, well, let's look at Jesus and let's look at the cross. What does it mean to say that God is love? Let's look at Jesus. Let's look at the cross. Friends, that means that love is selfless. It, it doesn't, in Paul's words from 1 Corinthians 13, it doesn't seek its own. W which, I don't know if you twig, but that's the opposite direction to how we talk about love in our culture. L love is normally used as a word aimed at ourselves and essentially means either to, to do what I want, to engage perhaps in a bit of 
uh, self-care, which not everything associated with that is wrong, but to, uh, to do what I would want in any situation or to affirm another in doing what they would want. As though our romantic feelings, our desires, were the determiner of what was good. They aren't. Instead, we find love in this, that the Divine Son, who has been with the Father and the Spirit, God, from before eternity, if such a thing makes sense to say, who is the unmoved mover, who is the unmitigated source of all things in whom you and I live and move and have our being whether we know him or not who is the the one who is holds the universe in his hands the principle by which creation was ordered and spoken and affected and continues to be created moment by moment the one who speaks your heartbeat, every beat, every beat, not just sort of set the world up, but every beat of your heart and mine, as it beats and it beats and it beats and it beats, happens because God in his infinite eternal will says beat, beat, beat. There is nothing which is outside of his will. He is never the author of evil, but does permit it sometimes, but yet speaks creation. He is big, which is a small thing to say about him, and he is beyond our fathoming. He is to us essentially incomprehensible because we are so different from him. And then the sun. having planned with his father and the spirit, their love for each other personified, that they could do something about the wretchedness of their creation, who had turned their back on the good and on God himself and run our own way, running amok and messing up everything we touched. He left heaven. He left the throne of God. He left privilege. He left his rights. He left everything in ways that are unimaginable for us to even begin to get our hands around. He left it and he chose instead to take up humanity, to become one of us, still being the eternal God, holding everything in his palm but also becoming a very, very real man. With all of our weaknesses and pains and struggles. But yet somehow, almost again, unimaginable for us if we're honest with ourselves, he did not sin. He followed the way of the Lord like no human has ever and then to, to cut a long story very short as he traveled and taught, he was exposed to a brutal torturer's death and hung shameful, exposed to ridicule, and given a death which declared him to be God forsaken and so he became so that he could be what John here calls our propitiation, which is not everything that happened on the cross, but it, not an everyday word, I suppose, unless you're familiar with uh, Greek myths, perhaps, but it means wrath, anger turned aside. So it became the, the sacrifice that would assuage, that would turn the anger of God away from his own creation. Like in that moment when God crushed God, to turn aside God's own anger as the Trinity did their wonderful work together on the cross. And why did he do that? To come and get you, to burn up your shame 
and to bear your sin in his own body so that we in him might become the righteousness of God. That, that story, that is what love is. If you ever wonder, what does it mean to be loving? It is to act like that, which I hope your heart is now feeling is far beyond you, far beyond you. You're right, beloved, it is, it is far beyond me too. But to be truly selfless, to put, despite being the one who holds all power, to, to put it down and allow yourself to be subjected to those who are your creatures when you are the almighty creator. This is a deep thing. That's what love is. God is love. That's who he is. Which is actually to say the same thing as I just have, that, that God is, is triune, that he is three in one. Because love requires an object. It requires a beloved. We don't think of it like that. But if you took someone and locked them in a room for um, reasons we won't get into because the analogy would be very stretched, but, and, and they didn't interact with anyone ever again in their lives, it would be very difficult for them to love. I might even go as far as to say I'm not sure they could love because love requires an object. It requires a beloved. Or particularly maybe to put the analogy differently, if they'd never encountered another human, they grew up in this cell for some bizarre reason, they would not know what love was because it requires an object, it requires a beloved. But God, who is three persons in one, has loved not himself, but also himself, as one of the persons loves the other two eternally, which means that he is, unlike any God in any religion, the true living God, Yahweh, above all gods, perfectly fitted to love others because he has always been within himself never needing anything having no lack but yet orientated towards others which is how he is now orientated towards you so to love is to prefer another to love is to put them before you to love is to act like jesus and give up everything you have in order to benefit someone else even if they don't care that's love that's a really difficult thing to be told to do. So here again, the force of John's words, beloved, let us love one another. Like that. Well, that is our primary call as Christians to love. Which I think maybe out in the world people have sort of picked up on. Sometimes you hear us uh, accused that we are not very loving by people who are either looking uh, in from the outside and curious, or people who are accusatory from the outside and, and not so curious. Well, maybe, actually, maybe they have a point. Sometimes I suspect we are not. After all, John's context is that he, he is telling them that they need to, to divide between truth and error. You know, they need to test the spirits. He's saying, but you must do it in love. We don't always do that very well speaking for myself as much as Christians in general. But it is often a misunderstanding to say that we are not very loving. We have seen throughout this letter that God is love. And, that, and as John's already told us, God is light. Love and light. Love, therefore, what, what does John mean? He, he means love tells the truth. Though, love does not beat you over the head with the truth. But it means love would say, yeah, it, it is sin. It is sin, what you're doing. It is not the way of Jesus. It is sin to, I'm going to pick some examples out of the air. There'll be a thousand more things than this. But it is sin to, to cheat on your taxes, even though it seems like a victimless crime. That's not okay. Love says you need to stop doing that. It is sin to lust, to engage in pornography, perhaps to, or to sleep with your boyfriend. To, to engage in sex outside of the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. That's, that's not right. That's not the way of Jesus. And love would say it's not. 
it is sin to use food to comfort yourself endlessly rather than go to God. It is sin. And love would say, then no, stop that, come, come to the Lord. But on each of those occasions, and on everything else that the, the word would say is not right for us, on each of those occasions, to do so in a way that is accusatory or hateful, or has any motivation other than someone who is already following the way, following the way better, it is also sin. Because beloved, we must love one another. We must love one another. And saying that we have to know that for all of us who sin, which is all of us watching this, though hopefully we make progress in holiness, that when we falter and when we fall, God will pick us up again when we repent. That the Lord's posture towards you is not an angry finger, but open arms saying, come and live this way instead. That is not good for you. Come and live my way. It will do you good and you will flourish. Because beloved lo friends, <laughs> love looks like Jesus who gathered little children around him and was kind to them and who rebuked those who put religious laws on people and made life hard and who spoke about hell more than anyone else in the Bible and who fought the powers of hell with his every breath, who was more gentle than you can possibly grasp and more fierce than a raging lion, who was before he was incarnate the one who both rained down sulphur on Sodom and who walked with the pomp of angels in the garden to Sabbath worship with Adam and Eve. Love looks like Jesus. Love obeys the commandments. Love prefers the weaker brother. Love hates lies but it never uses any of those things as an excuse to think of itself as better than someone else. We must love one another. Love, friend, love, love is not tolerance, as though God were senile, benevolent and drowsy. The God who is love made the world in a breath the God who is love is, we're told in Hebrews, a consuming fire. He is jealous and inexorable. But he loves you and he's tender towards you like a mother with her chicks. God loves you, friends. And he would say, come and follow me. Come and live the way of Jesus. And so when again, when we're told, beloved, let us love one another. Th this is what love is. Gentle, but clinging to the truth. Selfless, preferring others. So friends, that is what we must do. We must selflessly love one another. We must give of ourselves to each other without want of reward. I sometimes, if I, and I'm not as good at this as I might hope, but if I think, oh, I want to do this thing that is very loving towards this other person, would sometimes think, what if they don't notice? It doesn't matter. The Lord did not come to rescue us for fear that we might not notice. Many haven't. It's not simply kindness, though, again, it would often begin there. But, but King's Church, what can you give up for others in the church? What can you, how, where and how can you put others in King's Church Birmingham before yourself? Where and how can you honour and prefer others 
in King's Church Birmingham before yourself. That is to be what it is to love. And so, dear friends, we, we read as we have that love is our fruit because, verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. It's not an optional thing. It's not for Christians who've reached a certain level as though there were such a thing. It's not for kind of mature discipleship. Love is where we begin and it's where we end. Of course we sin, all of us failing and not doing as well as we could. And Jesus is there with open arms saying, come back, come back. And always welcomes us, always welcomes us with deep forgiveness, much beyond what we thought we needed. But in his, uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote its famous him to love, chapter 13, does this describe you? And of course, some of your answer, I'm going to read it to you, your answer will be, well, no, not really. But a better question maybe is, does this describe you more than it used to when you started following Jesus? Because I think it should. Jesus does this perfectly. We do it imperfectly as we mirror him. But we should make progress because we're supposed to love one another. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Could you put your own name in, in place of the word love? You might just want to try that for yourself. Because that's people that we're called to be. That's what we're supposed to do. First, inside the church, not to everyone to begin with. The church is the schoolhouse of faith. We learn how to behave, how to be the new humanity, how to love each other, how to care for each other how to look after the poor. We learn it in the church and then we take it to the world. But we do have to learn it in the church first. And you might be thinking, Tim, I can't do that. You're right, you can't. I mean, John goes on to say in chapter five that we, we do not have the love of God in our hearts. We are not people who naturally love. We certainly can't sustain what we might start out to do in our, on our own. How can we love? Well, we look to Jesus. We look to the cross where he's defeated our sin, where he's won for us power by defeating the enemy, and where because we are loved, we find that we're free to love. It, essentially, no, you can't do it, but you can be loved into loving. Friends, you're loved. You're following Jesus here, I can tell you, you're loved. You're not following Jesus and thinking, I don't know about this, I can tell you, you're loved. You're loved, come in, trust him. You'll find an ocean opens to you of love beyond what you can actually imagine. The greatness of the one God who thinks thoughts much higher than your thoughts and yet for all his wonder and power and majesty, he loves you. Friends, he loves you. We I don't have the time to get into the rest of the beauty of the passage. We're told that there is no fear in love and love casts it out, which is to say there is no fear of judgment. Specifically what John's talking about. Why does he want to tell us that? This is why I'm telling you. So that we can draw near because there is no fear. And as we draw near, we discover that we're loved. And as we're loved, we begin, as we bask in the light of the love that is stronger than a thousand suns, we begin to mirror it just gently at first. So your application, dear friends, is simple today. You should love each other. And first, you should be loved. Simple. And yet the most difficult thing in the world. And yet you find that the God who spins galaxies 
has done it all for you because he loves you. Wow. Wow. Dear friends, in the name of Jesus and by the Holy Spirit, receive the love of the Father right now. May you know in your deepest, innermost bones that the God who is love loves you particularly, specifically. He has called you out. Can you perhaps even gently hear him whisper your name that he is for you and he has come to get you and he wants you to live right he loves you too much to have anything else for you but you cannot escape from his love if you try it receive that in the name of Jesus Father we thank you we cannot really even describe the weight and the scale and the heat of the love of you, the consuming fire, the one the Bible calls Isaac's fear. You are beyond us. And yet you love us. And we can only really hold it together by just keep on saying those two things. Would you impart that to our hearts? And then we want to return it to you, Lord, and say thank you. We love you. We know because you first loved us. But we love you. Would you teach us how to love each other? We're now coming to the close of our meeting. Um, I want to reiterate uh, the invitation to join us next Sunday on the 27th at the Edgerston Park Hotel to be together again, just to whet your appetite a little bit more. We've got a few faces, you know, we've all been longing to see our loved ones, our friends, our church family. Uh, so here are a few greetings. We're so excited.
excited to see you. We can't wait to see you. We are looking forward to seeing you very soon. I am looking forward to seeing you very soon. We, we can't, can't wait, wait to, to be together, together again, again with our church, church family. family. See you soon. See, See you soon. soon. See you soon. See you soon. I can't wait to be together. And uh, just to reiterate a few of the key messages, do remember to book your place if you'd like to be together again on the 27th at Edgerston Park Hotel. We we'll send an email on Monday. You can get it on our website, through our social media channels. You have to book your place. We can't wait to see you. If you're not able to be there, then do head to our YouTube channel and you can check us out online as we will be live streaming. And also see you at the prayer meeting on Wednesday. It's going to be so good to pray, to seek God's face, you know, wherever we're coming from, uh, that we might might be a united people following him into the next step of the adventure. On the Sunday itself, just uh, one more little teaser, we're going to be having a picnic and uh, we're going to be meeting outside in our groups of 6 and 30. Um, I just want to encourage you, why don't you bring some food, some drink, um, we'll be able to meet outside, some outside space where we can gather and we can uh, catch up after all this time. So may God bless you, may you know his strength uh, with you this week, may his face shine upon you, may you know his goodness in all that you do. God bless you, see you soon.